When there is a time in people's lives where they want to get away from the daily routine of ordinary life, they search for that one night to take them away into the early hours of the morning. Since the early 1990s, electronic music has invaded the nightclub scene with all its mighty force, showing people another way to let loose. For the people who didn't want to go and get drunk in the local pubs, they had the rave culture that took them elsewhere. And growing up with my dad being one of the men behind the club hit Binary Finery 1998 is a topic I need to learn more about. We are about to discover how, specifically, London rave culture has evolved itself from the 90s to the billion dollar industry it is today, and if its revolutionary spirit has carried on through the decades, and how our beloved DJs from all over London have helped people find themselves with their electronic synths, beats and melodies. I'm Mia Harrison, and this is London Rave Cult. To start off our journey, we have Anton, also known as DJ Scanton. Anton and I have been friends since first year in university, where we both shared the excitement of hosting parties in our university kitchens, playing all the latest club hits. Since then, Anton has been working himself up the DJ ladder and has recently got booked to DJ at Egg London. Tonight he plays at a smaller venue alongside his friend Smiley and invited me to join him and get involved. We're going to play 4 till 5, bring, bring in the tech house, dirty beats, you know what I'm saying, the bangers, you know what I'm saying, I'll play on I think it's an energy and a vibe. I mean, a lot of people out here really are searching for stuff they don't really even know. You walk up to people and people will hug me in a rave. In a club and whatnot, you walk up and you just feel negativity. You come, you get, a, you get a buzz from the music, you get an energy from the people around you. And it brings people together, it literally does. There's no fun, there's no clashing, there's, it's just pure love. Like everyone's happy, everyone's buzzing, everyone's on that vibe of goodness. Like it's, it's a vibe, everyone needs to get on it. Like if you're not on it, like, you, you're losing, you're losing. After Anton's set, I managed to speak with him and see what he had to say about his view on London raving. When I turned 18, I started going to raves, and the vibe just caught me straight away. I just. I don't know, I just found my home I guess, like, everyone, everyone I met was so interested, everyone had something new to say, everyone was so friendly. That's kind of our slogan, is that the belief in music bringing people together, or dreams bringing people together through music. One company called Loot, who is a very important company at the moment, they're the people that are trying to implement um, drug safety into festivals and raves where you can get your drugs tested and stuff, which is what the government should have been doing a long time ago, in my opinion. What's in government right now have a very harsh stance on drugs, and the way drugs are dealt with, in my opinion, is not the right way to be done. Anton made a good point regarding the loop about how implementing drug safety within the rave scene is so important. I got in contact with The Loop and had a response from Chris Brady, one of the main volunteers, to see if he could speak with us. I brought Anton along with me to speak with Chris so we could find out about all the current and future drug education and the impact they make within our rave culture. I'm under the understanding that you work with The Loop. Uh -huh. yeah. So yeah. first of all, I thought it'd be a good idea to understand what Loop has done in order to prevent or lower um, irresponsible drug use. Uh, we are the first organisation in the UK to bring front of our, what we call front of our drug testing to the UK whereby somebody can bring their drugs to us, their drugs will be tested by one of our chemists and then the results of that test will be fed back to the person uh, by healthcare professional, drugs worker, doctor, nurse and like that as part of what we call a 15 minute harm reduction intervention so we talk about what's in the drug what they know about the drug, what they need to know about the drug and what the risks are and how they can hopefully reduce some risks if they are going to take that drug. Did they understand what the drug was before they came to you or do you feel like they've been enlightened when you've spoke to the people that you've helped? It's been really interesting. I mean, I mean, some people don't quite know uh, what the risks are and what harm reduction advice they need to sort of reduce some risks. But What's been quite heartening, or certainly over this summer, is, is that a lot of young people have been reading up, have been looking into the risks associated with the drugs that they're taking, and are taking responsibility for themselves. At the moment you're doing some festivals, do you think the next step is to get funding to allow you to have loop testing in clubs all over London, or even the country? One of the things is you've got to consider there's, there's so many different types of testing. We, we follow one particular model, which is a 
people's drugs are tested using the tests that we use and then they sit down for 15 minutes with a harm reduction worker. That is one model, that is a model that Luke have been using at festivals in the UK. Other models, you've got Wedding Oss in Wales where you can post your drugs to the Welsh Government and this is funded by the Welsh Government so there is um, a precedent of governments getting involved in this in the UK. The problem we're doing it in clubs is if I walk into a nightclub at 10 o'clock, I've had beer before I walk in there, I might have had four, five, six pints before I go into that club and anybody else might have done as well. And if you're going to try and give a harm reduction advice to somebody who's already intoxicated, a lot of the messages are going to get lost and, and potentially you could be putting somebody at more risk mm -hmm. because they've walked away from there hearing the wrong message. If you want to learn more about The Loop, go to www wearetheloop.org Daniel Green is a resident DJ and radio presenter at Select Radio. He has been DJing for 20 years and has a lot to say about his experience. Over my, uh, over my years of DJing professionally in nightclubs all around, um, some of the things that I've seen, the, the, the difference in the rave culture that I've seen over the last 10 years, um, obviously popularity. Um, it's become uh, a lot busier, the nightclubs, uh, dance floors, uh, events are selling out a lot quicker than what they used to. Um, so the community has grown. The people that are actually into dance music has, has grown massively. It's become sort of socially acceptable, uh, whereas before it was a bit more underground and you kind of, you know, you had to go and to select places to hear that kind of music. Uh, it's become more glamorous, I think. It's one of the things that you tend to see, you know, you, when you used to go out uh, sort of 10, 15 years ago, you had to wear shoes, trousers, and a, and a collar and a shirt. Whereas, and then it, and then it sort of, um, you're allowed to be a bit more free, wear trainers in nightclubs. But now it's been a bit more, it's become a bit more glamorous where girls really dress up to really stand out. Uh, and guys make a, a much more of an effort, I think. Um, there's a lot more money uh, that's thrown into it. Uh, I heard somewhere that it's a $4.3 billion industry now. I feel that another thing that's changed massively, which I'm a big fan of, is, is uh, event producers have become a lot more creative uh, and they're finding um, rarer, um, sometimes never used spaces to, to put on club nights. Um, a lot more creativity has gone into them, not just turn up to an empty dark warehouse with just a couple of stacks and a booth and you're listening to music, they're actually going full out with the likes of Elro, bringing phenomenal production. Before I left Select Radio, Daniel brought on a very special guest. Now we're going to go and talk to our guest. Usually I, uh, I ask my guests to introduce themselves and tell, them, tell us who they are and what they do, but on this occasion I want to do it myself. So standing next to me is someone who saw an abandoned bus station in South East London and turned it into one of London's premier nightclubs. I'm talking about the founder, the creator, the owner of Ministry of Sound, Justin Boatman. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, thank how, you. How owner that? not, but everything else was more or less there, yeah. <laughs> no, close. But certainly founder, yeah. But it's funny, because when I asked you to come on and we actually spoke over the phone, um, it was one of the things you're passionate about as well, isn't it? Sound and, and understanding the, the nature of it. So it's not just about DJing, understanding sound as well and how to manipulate sound to give that experience to the customer. So some, there's going to be people obviously that don't quite understand, they quite can't sort of recognise the difference between digital and analog or, you know, how can you sort of simplify it in a way that makes it easy for people to understand that it's actually for their sort of audio pleasure, hearing something a bit more authentic than a bit digital? Well, I think first of all, to be a bit, uh, a bit, um, whatever, I would say that you can't fake it with analog. You can't fake it with vinyl. I mean, you know, nowadays we have a lot of, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, unfortunately some DJs out there who are, who are not really doing it. And when you have vinyl and turntables, you can't fake it. I mean, you can't stick on a cassette and pretend. Because you <laughs> so that's first of all one thing it cleans out a lot of people. It's sort of that fake news that we've got nowadays. It was fake DJs being going on for a while now, mm. and that's down to digital. Because when it became very easy, it became very easy to cheat. Mm. So in the old days, there was no one cheating. Everyone was really doing it because you know if you had to play an eight-hour set, you had to know what you were doing. Yeah. So that's where we've gone. We've so the, 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 there's that degradation, that sort of decay that's gone on in the scene musically <clears throat> in terms of DJs. Obviously, the brilliant are still there and the brilliant are still working. But uh, for me, I think the whole digital analog thing, I, I just heard it for myself what it does at, um, at the ministry. And when you use a more analog sound system, you have analog mixers and stuff like that, and you play vinyl, it just sounds better. It sounds that the bass is more in, in, inside, comes more from it within. Mm. Because you have that bone induction from the speakers on the dance floor, which is floating, that makes your whole body vibrate, and the sound comes from within. Mm. It's like your skeleton is part of the sound system, yeah. and you are part of the sound system. 
you are part of the music, you're in there, you know, yeah. in this like lake of music. We have learned that the London rave culture has grown in size, become more commercial, and I guess socially acceptable. We are now more aware that the drug education and high security nowadays is crucial because of the changes. When the rave scene hit the UK and London, it became a movement of acid house and warehouse parties, with the likes of Fantasia and Amnesia. Everyone around the world had their own ways of expressing the rave culture too, such as Goa Trance in India. The UK in 1992 had Pendragon, a movement that used to combine raving with Celtic mythology, and held events on sacred dates. Kate and Mark welcomed me into their home and gave me more insight. Hello Mark and Kate. Hi. Uh, thank you for letting me interview you guys. I know that you've definitely got a lot of insight to bring to um, my research and just just to start us off, tell me what is Pendragon? Uh, Pendragon was a concept that we uh, created um, through our own love of Celtic mythology and um, imagery that we wanted to sort of input into the party scene, into, into our parties. And with the use of um, images and astrology and uh, mythology, um, so that they were that was the basic concept behind Pendragon. Yeah, we used to sort of um, just do actually sort of do our parties particularly on sort of Celtic um, dates you know mm. sort of the Lammas and summer solstice things like that mm. so everything was like really meticulously researched if uh, luckily for us upstairs we had an astrologer that used to do a, a chart for the day mm. and so we'd know where all the moons and the planets were and also there was a lot of symbolism behind yeah. Just sort of basic stuff like that, you nice. know, and uh, and uh, you know where the you know where certain sort of backdrops were put in the you know in in whichever place we did, and, yeah, everything was sort of like really researched actually, just to sort of make an amazing sort of atmosphere and mm. to yeah invoke sort of uh, exactly what was happening on that date. Mm. So it's uh, and, you know we'd have rituals and things. Yeah, it was quite unique as well at mm. the time. You know, because there was a lot of Goa trance, there was a lot of Indian and uh, Shiva and mm -hmm. Buddha, those sort of images coming out. Yeah. And we decided that we would use our own culture. Mm -hmm. And so we, we started off doing about four a year, mm -hmm. um, but then um, we, there were, there's obviously more festivals that were in between those four main ones. And as we, as, as we started getting more popular, then obviously we, we started doing a lot more parties and we obviously became monthly eventually. Mm -hmm. But there was always something in a month that yeah. would, um, mm -hmm. even if it was just the full moon, you know, we'd yeah, work yeah. on that. So. Um, we were always, and every every party was different. Mm, we would yeah. we would change the decor in every party, yeah. and we would leave no stone unturned. We turn it into a magic wonderland rather than yeah, the venues. Yeah. We'd go into a crusty old warehouse and turn it into this yeah. magical, multicoloured, amazing sort of space for people to come. Yeah. This was painted by uh, Vicky. This this was this was our logo. So this is this is the actual Pendragon logo that we used on all our flyers, and um, we had, we had an amazing flyer designer called Billy. He was the fractal designer. He, he designed his own fractals, and uh, he put this image within in his fractals, and so that all the image in his fractals became Celtic. Mm. So the Celtic fractals, and so our flyers. We had nothing on the front of our flyers, um, and so every time somebody saw it, they knew that it was a pen dragon flying. So we had an, in, in, an an immediate sort of image um, identity yeah. uh, that no one else had. It was unique. The nostalgia from the '90s, the club hits, the icons, the event spaces. All aspects throughout the 20 years have carried on in its own unique way. I can understand that some things come to an end, and the way people used to party in the 90s is nothing like today. But we have a new and exciting way to let loose in today's rave culture. Our use of event spaces, creating amazing artistic atmospheres, having those 90s icons as our headliners, and safer environments with the help of security and the loop is what still keeps the magic alive. Being creative, socialising with good people and surrounding yourself in good energy is the most important thing. It was in the 90s and it still is today.